it still hasn't gotten out. We're live, Jim. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you a little belatedly today uh, to uh, Humanity Rising. Uh, we had some difficulties with Zoom. Uh, we were all set to go, and uh, all of a sudden, the broadcast button disappeared uh, from Rick's uh, module. Uh, so we've had to recreate things. So thank you uh, for your patience. Um, we want to welcome you today to contemplate one of the most important issues uh, in the world, certainly one of the important issues that's been present in all of our lives as a result of the pandemic, but an issue that is not very often addressed. And that's the issue of grief. How do we take the time in our individual lives to simply grieve what's happening? Not to fight about it, not to be angry about it, not to try to even do something about it, but simply to rest in a container of grief that allows our vulnerabilities and our insecurities, but also our hopes and our dreams to be incubated uh, in a certain kind of darkness where mysteriously uh, there, is, there is much light. Uh, and so I want to uh, thank all of you for joining. Uh, I want to uh, now turn it over to Kayleen Asbo, uh, who's uh, uh, a new best friend uh, who has recently joined uh, uh, the faculty of uh, the Wisdom School of Ubiquity University uh, and now is teaching with us and actually came up with the idea uh, to do a Humanity Rising uh, session on this very important matter of grief. So Kayleen, welcome, and I turn the program over to you. Thank you. And I think if we were to take this morning as a metaphor, we would see that one of the things that we grieve is the loss of connection with one another and how everything is falling apart, how the things that we rely on, the things that have been tried and true are disappearing and they're broken. And what do we do about that? So we're going to reconfigure what we had originally intended because of the shortened time. And I'm hoping that, that we can uh, come back and perhaps have a conference later. But what we're going to do right now is try to enter into that realm in which we can alchemize grief. Because if we don't do something with it, it sticks. We all know that sensation of tears stuck in our throat that's called globus hystericus. We all know the physical embodied sensation of having food poisoning in our body and what a relief it is to get it out there. The words of the Gospel of Thomas that are so resonant in my mind, especially at this time, if you bring forth what is inside of you, what is inside of you will save you. And if you don't bring forth what is inside of you, what is inside of you will destroy you. And I think as well of the words of Mary Oliver, who says, tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. And then she turns our attention to not miss the wild geese flying in the high, clear blue sky where we find ourselves in the family of things. So today I want to invite you to people that I consider to be kindred spirits of my heart. The people that I'm going to introduce you today are people who have inspired me for years, sometimes decades, and who I consider to be the great alchemists of grief who have found through ritual, through poetry, through song, an extraordinary way to take those tears that are stuck inside of us and to move them so that they become spiritual gold, that they get transformed to become light and love and hope for the world. 
So we'll introduce them more in detail later, but I'm going to turn this right now to my dear friend, Doug Van Koss and Larry Robinson, who will each offer one poem before then we enter into the sacred work of grief with my mentor, Francis Weller. And I'll say a few words more about him when Doug and Larry are done with their poems. So Doug, to you, my friend. Oh, Larry, if you would begin. So Kaylee mentioned our dear departed Mary Oliver and her poem, Blackwater Woods, she says, look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of the cattails are bursting and blowing away over the blue shoulders of the pond. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year at this time, everything I have ever learned in my entire life leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever understand. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your own body, knowing that your own life depends upon it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Thank you, Larry. W.H. Auden in 1936 was not as hopeful. This is called funeral blues. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone, silence the piano, and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my working week, my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought love would last forever, but I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack away the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the oceans and sweep up the wood, or nothing now can ever come to any good. Thank you, Doug. The principle of alchemy says that everything falls apart and then we go into the second stage where we sob and cry our tears and are purified. And if we get to the bottom of that well of grief, we will indeed find spiritual gold. I have witnessed that process over and over and over again over the 15 years in the work of Francis Weller, whom I introduced you now to. He is a ritualist par excellence, and his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow about community grief should be required reading for our times. Psychotherapist, mentor, leader of men's communities, specialist in initiation rituals. I'm going to hand this over to my beloved friend and mentor, Francis, to speak to you on this collective need that we have to grieve, not just our own individual sorrows, but the sorrows of our ancestors, the sorrows of our community, the sorrows of our world, the sorrows of our broken, breaking, burning planet. So to you, my friend Francis, and I'm going to ask Doug to make sure that you're muted now and Kate as well, so that we can have Francis's voice in full effect. To you, my friend. Mm. Thank you, Kayleen. You could have kept going. You were doing a beautiful job there. And so I want to thank you, Kayleen and Jim, for this uh, warm invitation to be part of this wonderful series that you have. 
And I'm delighted to be sharing this time with my dearest friends, Larry and Doug, and also to honor Kate for your many years of offering uh, nourishment to the grief saturated souls of our communities. So thank you, Kate. There's an eternal dance between grief and gratitude. And uh, so it's good to start with that appreciation, particularly in this delicate moment when so much is at stake. And I often say in my work with people that the um, mark of a mature human being is the capacity to hold grief in one hand and gratitude in the other. And to be stretched large by these two powerful presences in our life. To choose one or the other causes trouble. If we only choose grief, eventually the heart will become saturated and there will be a sense of bitterness that ensues. But if we only choose gratitude, there's a certain... Uh, lack of depth of compassion for the suffering of others, but together they make the prayer of life. And they are happening simultaneously on any given day, at any given moment. Any breath you take in of sorrow can be met with the exhalation of, of uh, awe and beauty and enchantment. So I was also deeply grateful to come across the title for this program when Kayleen invited me, The Art of Grief, The Art of Grief. The title itself is freeing, the art of grief. It frees us from the weighty and very confining grip of the clinical world, where grief is often reduced to pathology, to malady. And a clinical approach requires a clinical response. And so we treat it with diagnoses and with oftentimes a pharmaceutical regimen, as if we're trying to silence the grief. But the art of grief, that evokes a soulful response, an aesthetic response, where we can come from the depths of our being with an appreciation and we can begin to appreciate how the grief itself works us and ripens us and deepens us. It's like view, viewing a piece or listening to a piece of deep music or a, or a painting and sensing how it affects me rather than is this good or bad, right or wrong getting out of the moralistic dualities and into the aesthetic response of soul is our first move when we come to grief. So the art of grief itself invites us to consider grief as a craft, as a skill. One of my ideas that, I, that I've been tracking is that grief is not just an emotion, but it's a core human faculty. It's a skill. And unless we de develop that skill, Whenever grief arrives at our door, we do not know how to respond. So we are overwhelmed by the immensity of what we're experiencing. And we have very little sense of how grief is meant to ripen and deepen us. We live in a grief phobic world and we often are reduced to living what I call a flatline culture where there's very little room for us to experience the full breadth of our emotional lives. When we abandon the lower register of sorrow, we collapse the upper register of joy. And so we're caught, we're stuck in a very narrow range of what allows us to be human. Here's a poem by Rainer Marie Rilke, which I think has so much compassion in it around grief. He said, it's possible I am pushing through solid rock in flint-like layers as the ore lies alone. I am such a long way in, I see no way through and no space. Everything is close to my face and everything close to my face is stone. I don't have much knowledge yet in grief. So this massive darkness makes me small. You, you be the master. Make yourself fierce, break in. Then your great transforming can happen to me and my great grief cry can happen to you. We don't have much knowledge yet in grief, still, at this time. But he suggests that grief itself is the teacher. The grief is the master, the transformer. And that's a radical statement of faith. We have basically lost faith with grief. We treat it as an intrusion, as an as a invader, as something we should try to resist and to repel. But here's Rilke saying, you be the master, make yourself fierce, 
break in, then your great transforming can happen to me. So that again is a tremendous statement of faith that grief is actually not meant to take us hostage, but is actually there to ripen and deepen us as human beings. There is an innate wisdom in sorrow. Today, in this time of multiple and chronic losses and sorrows, grief can often feel overwhelming. I don't feel our psyches were wired for 24 hours a day trauma incursions. We were wired for the news of the watershed. We were wired through our long evolutionary story to address the sorrows and rips and tears in the community, but locally. So what we're facing right now is overwhelming at times, and we really don't know how to stay open to that. And the heart wisely, I think, shuts down. So I wanna say a little bit of praise for numbness, for dissociation as a means of survival. Because the, the, the truth is that most of us have been asked to face this torrent of grief in solitary confinement. We've been asked to face it as individuals, alone, privately. And the weight of that grief is overwhelming. It is too much. What we, what we needed to process this grief had been basically deprived. We, had, we don't have what we need to get there. So the, the heart must shut down. For us to remain open and vulnerable to the sorrows of the world, we require tempering and ripening. We need the arts of grief. And we also require places of shelter. We have to come back into the primal matrix, the original context for which and how we approached the grief of our lifetime. I often say at the beginning of our grief rituals, how strange it is that we need a workshop on grief. How odd it is that people have to travel literally from Australia, from England, all across the United States and Canada to come to our grief rituals, just for the privilege of being able to grieve side by side with another human being. This is at the heart of our sorrow. At the heart of our sorrow is a profound amnesia and a resulting anesthesia, the two primary sins of Western culture, amnesia and anesthesia. We forget and we go numb. And the amnesia is that we forget how interdependent we are, how entangled we are with everything around us and how bereft we are by this forgetting. It takes great psychological strength to turn and face the wild edge of sorrows. It, it's fierce heat, it's difficult memories, the intense emotions. And I think it requires that we undertake an apprenticeship with sorrow. And the idea of the apprenticeship is, is very apropos here because it, it suggests that it is a prolonged and extended study. We don't master grief quickly. We don't understand its customs and its rights and its demands on us quickly. It takes a long and, and uh, extended period of time to be ripened into its, its uh, requirements. John O'Donohue, uh, I know most all of you know, um, said that life is a growth in the art of loss. Think about that. Life is a growth in the art of loss. It isn't so much a growth in you know, Western psychological ideations about growth are always about improvement, about strengthening and building our capacities. But he's saying that it's actually a growth in the art of loss, as Mary Oliver would say, about letting go, about letting go, about being thinned. So once again, we're reminded that the work is about soul and learning how to be a good host to what comes. Grief belongs to what I call the commons of the soul. It is not a problem to be solved. It is a presence awaiting witnessing and it rarely gets that deep witnessing. And we need that witnessing both internally, interiorly and also communally. Problems arise when we are deprived of those ingredients the conditions that require to adequately set down grief are often missing. 
people come into my practice oftentimes with the de- with the uh, complaint of depression and as i sit and listen to their stories it's not depression it's oppression they're suffering from the accumulated weight of generations and generations of un- unacknowledged sorrow and it, it crushes the soul it crushes the spirit and we live in a very positivistic culture as i say which denies grief its full presence and we push sorrow to the margins we are a happy culture even our psychological world right now is seems to be fixated on happiness there's nothing wrong with happiness i love happiness but i remember i was uh, visiting my friend maladoma somay's village in western africa and there was a woman there and i said to her you have so much joy <clears throat> and her immediate response was well that's because i cry a lot it wasn't because i keep busy or i have a new car or you know i have a new cell phone she made the direct relationship between sorrow and joy again that lower register and the upper register and when again when we mute that lower register we lose our joy we fear grief and partly because it has been so sequestered we don't see it as a constant companion something that we walk with every day which is part of our apprenticeship to come into right relationship to sorrow to see it that every day we we encounter loss whether it's through the news that we hear of another species disappearing or driving to work and seeing the road the kill you know the road kill on the side every day or the homeless or we hear about more economic disparity people suffering it's there every day grief unsettles us it pulls us from the ordinary world particularly in those searing times of acute loss we leave the daily lit world and we enter a shadowed land where we can barely see many cultures call this a time of living in the ashes in the old norse traditions the scandinavian traditions they lived in long houses 50 60 people sharing a, a long house together and it was heated by down the middle of the long house by the fire and when you were in deep grief when you lost someone you love or there was some tragedy in your life you lived in the ashes that's where you slept so when you woke in the morning you were covered in ash and everyone knew that you were being marked by something profound and the requirement at that time was to be faithful to the to that underworld journey you nothing was expected of you for sometimes up to a year but to complete the underworld tasks of metabolizing this grief into medicine for the community that's also part of the apprenticeship we realize over time that the grief that i'm asked to carry and to work with is not meant for me alone but at some point it's meant for me to turn back and throw it like seed to a very hungry and waiting community when grief arrives at our door we are taken into the underworld the time of darkness as jim was mentioning it is an initiation into the mysteries of loss a time of descent we live in a very ascension oriented culture we like things rising it's very heroic we like success we like competency we like things rising we get nervous when things begin to fall but that's where grief takes us the word grief itself comes from gravis which means heavy we are pulled to our knees we're taken downward when grief arrives the other problem is is that our associations between light and dark have become quite binary the light being good the darkness being bad and we must begin to understand the holiness that dwells in the darkness There's a line of Rilke's in one of his poems I have many brothers in the south where he said and yet no matter how deeply I go down into myself my god is dark and like a webbing made of a hundred roots that drink in silence we have to begin to re- re- reconnect and recognize where we are taken when grief takes us is into sacred ground Oscar Wilde said wherever there is sorrow there is holy ground
grief itself is so central to our own ripening as human beings. We do not mature, I don't think, without some prolonged intimacy with sorrow and grief. So what do we require to meet the demands of sorrow? How can we be transformed by this challenging process? I think that's what I wanna spend the rest of my time talking about. I think the first thought I would share is another one of John O'Donohue's, which is that the approach itself is crucial here. He said, what you encounter, what we encounter, recognize or discover depends to a large degree upon the quality of our approach. When we approach with reverence, great things decide to approach us. Now there's an anthem in there all by itself. What you encounter, recognize or discover depends to a large degree upon the quality of your approach. When we approach with reverence, great things decide to approach us. Imagine approaching reverence like Rilke did, you be the master. That's a statement of reverence. That's a statement of recognizing the sacrality of this presence in our lives. When we can do that, great things will approach us. So we start with a reverence of approach. That's our first move. The second move is to recognize that grief has always, always in our long story as a species been communal. It has never been private, solely private. Of course, we have our private time with grief, but the context has almost always been communal. It has never in our long story been so denied the courtesy of accompaniment as it is now. Uh, we are asked to somehow do this difficult work singularly, solely. In fact, we even go to private practice to go to talk to somebody about it. Even that image tells us something about how much we have sequestered grief into its own very narrow territory. It's part of how we've colonized grief and taken it into territories where we can try to control it and dominate it but grief is wild, it is feral. You cannot domesticate grief. When it comes, it shakes us and rattles the house, which is again why we try to rise above it. Um, so the first, again, the first requirement, full requirement is community. We need an energetic field strong enough to hold the wild edge again of our grief. Now, when we gather in our circles, we begin by sharing one thread of grief that's come in the door with you. Typically we carry many threads of grief, but as we go around the circle and share one thread, we begin to see that that cloth, when it's woven together, this is our grief. This is our communal cup. So one of the things that grief shared communally does for us is that it allows us to loosen the fiction that this is mine that this is my singular experience, my private experience. It might have a private or a personal tinge. Maybe you didn't have someone commit suicide in your life. Maybe you didn't have a child die. Maybe you're not suffering from the house that burned down in, in one of our recent fires, but you know loss. And every pair of eyes you meet on the street, even behind the mask, knows loss, knows suffering, knows grief. People, when they arrive in my office and the, we start to encounter grief, you can feel the fear that arises. Rarely is there such a thing as a pure grief moment because it's been so denied and so unheld, what arises is a grief panic moment, a grief terror moment. So part of what we need to do in our long prolonged accompaniment is to come into some space where we can begin to just hold the grief all on its own, where we can begin to put our faith back into it. So when people arrive in my office, I'll often say to them, you know, um, this is a good place to begin to tolerate contact with such vulnerable spaces in your soul. But ultimately you will need a larger holding space because this is what the psyche was shaped by. Our psyches evolved in a context in which our grief was going to be held by many. 
when I was again in the village in Africa, there was a grief ritual going on someplace almost every other day. And they were the happiest and most joyful people I ever met. And there's a direct relationship. The problem with having to do it privately, to be, to be demanded that we carry this in an interior means only is that you're lost because you, grief requires two things. It requires containment and release. And if I'm by myself, I cannot do both jobs. And so I become a permanent containment field for my grief. And you may notice that we are consist consistently recycling the old wounds, the old stories of our lives and even our ancestral lives. We don't have the ability to release it because the containment field isn't there. We are awaiting the presence of the community. The second or the third, I guess now, is um, the requirement of ritual. Ritual is the most ancient architecture, the most ancient means by which we would recalibrate the individual and the communal life after loss, after trouble. And ritual simply said is any gesture done individually or communally uh, done with emotion and intention, with an attempt to connect with the transpersonal energies for the purpose of healing. I sometimes make the distinction between ceremonial space and ritual space. I know some cultures don't do that, but ceremonial space is the horizontal space where we, we have wedding ceremonies, we have graduation ceremonies. Hopefully we'll have an inauguration ceremony coming up soon. Uh, those are all meant to reinforce the communal fabric, absolutely essential. We must have that communal fabric renewed over and over again. Ritual is the vertical dimension. It is the means by which we are shaken out of our familiar state. It allows us to encounter something along the line of derangement, which is a scary term. Ritual has the capacity to knock us off of our current functioning orbit. And that's the power of ritual. We hope we don't come out of a ritual the same as we went in. We want to be undone to some degree, shaken loose. We want to be deranged because the current arrangement is not working. And we want to be rearranged in a manner that's closer to the soul's approximation of how it wants to express itself in the world. Several years ago, I was at a class by, um, at Spirit Rock for one of my continuing education courses. And it was a class with Rick Hansen, wonderful teacher talking about the neuropsychology of trauma and uh, the practices that we take on internally to recalibrate after trauma. And I began thinking about that. They're wonderful practices, but for hundreds of thousands of years, the recalibration process was communal. It was ritual. That was the means by which we navigated the difficult terrain of being a human being. That was the terrain, that was the context in which we dealt with the inevitable encounters with loss and tragedy and death. Ritual, I said, is the most ancient form of, co of communal cohesion. It's how we re-knitted the fabric of the community over and over again. And we are wired for this mode of engagement. I've heard many, many times at our grief rituals, someone will say after it's over, you know, I've never done anything like this before but it felt oddly familiar. Something about the choreography, something about the gestures, something about the process itself is wired deep into our bones. Carl Jung said that we possess an unforgotten wisdom at the core of our psyche, an unforgotten wisdom, that somehow we know this territory, even though we've abandoned it, even though it's part of our amnesia, our forgetting. When we're offered it, when we step into our deep psychic inheritance, there is a process of remembering. We come back to recognizing the rightness of this gesture, this process. Ritual offers us a holding space strong enough to hold the fierce encounters with grief. It's undiluted energies of sorrow. And without that holding space, we will be very hesitant to open that gate to the eruptive and energetic process of sorrow. 
And that means that we're oftentimes pushed to the surface of our life. It's the have a nice day culture. Michael Mead gives us these, uh, Im this image of the three layers of human experience. The first layer is that surface layer. Hey, how's it going? Nice day, right? Yeah, 49ers this weekend. The third layer, he says, is, is deep soul contact. That sense of our mutually entangled lives. The second layer is grief, anger, hatred, fear, despair, jealousy. And he said, you can't get from layer one to layer three without going through layer two. And this is where <clears throat> the absence of collective practices, ritual, makes the journey one to three very, very difficult because we need fierce holding spaces, containers of strong space to engage those things meaningfully. Otherwise, we will engage it unconsciously, destructively. And this is a lot of what we're seeing collectively right now is uncontained expressions of layer two, the full expression of hatred, anger, rage, with no containment, no maturation through the process of fierce discipline. The Spanish poet uh, Federico Garcia Lorca said, it's always a dance between discipline and passion. We need passion, absolutely. Without passion, we would feel deadened. So, but without discipline, the passion has no containment. Think of Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin. Brilliant, fiery passion, but the, the lack of discipline. Think of the flamenco dancer. Exquisite passion rising through the body, held by the beautiful discipline of that form. And together they ignite into something incendiary, beautiful, elegant. That's what we need. Ritual offers a reparative function. It uh, provides the primary elements in revitalizing the soul following deep trauma. There was a study done with uh, Native American soldiers coming back from Afghanistan with PTSD. And they put them through a traditional psychotherapeutic processes and uh, for trauma. And the results were, you know, okay, about 40% recovery. And they said, well, let's try something different. <clears throat> let's put them back into vision quests, into sweat lodges, into pipe ceremonies. And the recovery rate more than doubled, 80 to 90%. And I began thinking about why that was. What is it about trauma? What is it about deep grief? And what I understood was that trauma tears us out of that collective sense of cosmological belonging. And what ritual and community do is they suture the tear. They knit us back into the body of belonging. And then they thought, well, maybe this is just about native soldiers because this is part of their cultural context. And then they took non-native soldiers and put them through the same processes and the same things happened. We are creatures of ritual. We require that suturing done by the inv invocation of the sacred, the presence of the community, the presence of the ground beneath us, the ability to express fully what is in our bodies and our hearts and our souls. And when those ingredients are provided and space is provided, there is reparative moves made to the soul. We are living in a time of what I call a rough initiation. When all of the ingredients of initiation are there, but they're uncontained. And I call traditional initiation a contained encounter with death. And I call trauma and the, and the field that we're in right now an uncontained encounter with death. The same three things happen. There's a severance from the world that was, there's a radical alteration in one sense of identity, and there's a profound realization that we can never go back to the world that was. In traditional initiation, this means this evokes a breakthrough into the widest aperture of identity. In trauma, the inverse is true. There's a collapse into a singularity, a sense of being taken out of contact, contact with the living fabric of life and the world. So again, we, we need these elements to be 
re-offered to us, reanimated in our collective. Ritual has a way of slowing us down to the speed of life. The Chinese spell busy, which is something we are very proud of in our Western culture. Uh, we stay very busy. They spell busy with two ideograms, heart killing. This is very instructive. We live in a manic driven culture. We are addicted to speed, but we must slow down to what my mentor Clark Berry called geologic speed. And that's part of what, what ritual does for us. It drops us into a speed that's indigenous to soul. We slow down. We begin to hear the voices of soul. We begin to attend to the things that matter to soul. And we are allowed then to experiment with the process of letting go, of not being in control, of being on our knees side by side with other human beings, weeping. There's something so profoundly healing about being side by side with our kin while we are weeping together, wailing together, bellowing together out of outrage. So grief is not just tears, it is also protest. It is also outrage. But it means that we must be willing to risk an expression of our deepest emotional body. And when the container of belonging is so fragile, we're always trying to present a self that has it together. And consequently, we don't have permission to express our deepest grief and sorrow. Mm -hmm. Mary Oliver, <clears throat> in one of her beautiful phrases, said, let us risk the wildest places, lest we go down in despair and comfort. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much, Francis. This is such beautiful work. Okay. Oh, and everyone who's listening, I want to just, again, commend to you two things, that you turn to Francis's beautiful book, uh, Entering the Healing Ground, and then there's a link to his website on the Wisdom Bridge. We'll need to go to Kate in just a moment. Um, Francis, do you have one more thing that you want to, to say to us before we, we go to Kate Munger? Well, I think what I would say is um, risk, risk those wildest edges those wildest places. The apprenticeship with sorrow, the old idea of apprenticeship led to, after that prolonged study, to a state of becoming a master, a master painter, artisan, uh, craftsman, or whatever. In the work of soul, that long apprenticeship with sorrow leads to elderhood. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are precisely needing right now. We need adult human beings who are willing to consistently turn their face into the heat of this time and not turn away because the young ones are waiting for enough of us to gather and give to them some sense that there are adults present in the world willing to develop that gravitas, that, that weightiness that will stay solid and present to the world as it is unfolding for what I am calling the long dark. Long dark, beautiful. Stay courageous. Stay connected. We so hope that Francis can come back and be part of a conference. I know I speak with for Jim too, that we all need a communal ritual in this apprenticeship with sorrow. So it's my deep hope that we'll be able to have you back, my my beloved mentor and friend. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I'd love to come back and join you again. And now everyone, I want to introduce you to a woman who literally sings to my heart. I met her decades ago now at an ORF Schulwerk uh, training to teach music and dance. And the image that I have most powerfully of Kate Munger, who is the founder of the Threshold Choir, is the day that we sang together in circle this song of grief and wailing, Jacques de Lagana, a song of lamentation. And then we turned and we danced and we sang a hymn of joy. And I remember seeing Kate's face be so radiant. And she told me the story then of a dream that she had and experience she had of sorrow. Francis spoke of the sorrows of the earth being midwife to death. And I believe that this is true and you'll, you'll correct me if it's not Kate, but part of your journey of founding the Threshold Choir 
was both being present for human beings, but also a deer that had been hit on the side of the road. And you told the story of coming and you couldn't fix it. You couldn't make the deer better. But what you could do is you can companion it with beauty and love and tenderness during its final breath. So Kate founded the Threshold Choir, which uh, we will speak about in just a moment, which now has international chapters all over the globe, whose job is to companion those who are ill, suffering, and dying through song. And she has mentored thousands and thousands of people right now in finding the alchemical seed of their own creativity, of finding words that give rise to their own voice, which then they share with the aching and breaking world. <clears throat> so Kate, with no further ado, I'm so grateful that you're here. Your work has been such a light in the darkness. And I turn it to you both to tell a little bit of your story, but also to lead us collectively in a ritual online of singing one of the, th or more, maybe we can have time for two of the Threshold Choir chants, and then we'll close with poetry by Doug and Larry. Thank you, Kayleen. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, honored to be among the panelists and especially want to acknowledge the willingness of all of you who are witnesses to this. I think um, willingness is an important aspect of dealing with grief and, and a, the best place to start. Um, I will tell you a tiny bit about the choir and its beginnings. We, um, we exist uh, as a group of choral singers who are called to bring our voices in service to the bedsides of people who are dying. We come in groups of two, three, or four when invited, and that's very important. We come only when invited. And um, it's usually a family gathered around a bedside of someone who's dying. And so often there are things that have not yet been said that need to be said. And singing, as we all know, is, you, you can't listen to something beautiful and musical and especially from the human voice without your heart opening. So it's an opportunity for a family to make an appointment for a heart opening. And we um, slip in, sit down quietly, start singing, invite, sing songs that are so simple that family members can join us. Um, they can be immersed in the harmonies and let their tears flow. I agree with Francis uh, that we are a, a lacrimophobic culture and it's very uh, rare to see authentic tears flowing down someone's cheeks without apology. And um, I, part, I think part of the mission of the Threshold Choir is to let the tears flow for men and for women. Um, then we slip out as fast as and, and gently as a whisper the way we came in. We often are called um, with a couple of weeks to go before the person's death. We especially love to create a relationship with the people, the family, the person who's dying. Um, that's our that's our favorite thing, but we also can slip in right at the end for the very last vigil. Um, and our most favorite thing is to sing for a long time over, over months with someone who is looking at their death. It's a gift to us. It's a gift to them. I th what our, what our singing does is recreate the tribal essence, the tribal community. Uh, my definition of tribe is people who all know the same songs. So if we're lucky, we get to sing together over time with the grieving family and the person who's dying. 
anticipatory grief, uh, I think is very helpful. Um, the, the participating in that because it reminds us every single moment that 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 the impermanence is what is um, and singing about it is so lovely because a song is a noun but it's evanescent it there's no there's no flavor there's no matter there's no weight to it so a song to me is that connection to what lies beyond about which we know very little so i love um i love singing as a metaphor for what we can do together to prepare ourselves hey, I, will you lead us in a in a, one of the chants that you've written so that people can hear you and we can we will all and the panelists uh, stay muted because of Zoom problems, but I just love what you've done with your own composition, but also yeah. all of the people that you've encouraged to write theirs. Yeah. I will. And um, the first song I want to uh, sh sing with you is the lyrics are by Alice Walker and the lyrics go, even as I hold you, I am letting go. And this really speaks to that impermanence that we um, as a culture have stopped um, admitting day by day. And uh, I think it's really helpful to remember. Um, I'll sing it a couple of times and I'll play a quick recording so you can see that you can sing it as a round, which we don't do at bedsides. Um, we offer lots of harmonies, but rarely um, singing as a round with different layers of um, text over one another. So here's the song. It's very short. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. And here it is as a multi-layered. Even as I hold you, I am letting go. Even as I hold you, as I hold you. So Kate, in your work with people and people can go online, are you, do you, is Threshold able to still meet on Zoom during this time? Can people find Threshold Choir and participate and learn the songs? Yes. No, we're in lockdown. Yes, uh, it is, it is, it has hampered our work directly with people in person, but a lot of facilities are willing to take around an iPad to individual mm -hmm. patients who have requested our service. And yes, uh, choirs are meeting by Zoom, but they're also offering song baths to the public. Mm -hmm. And you can find about all of this on our website, thresholdchoir.org. And uh, I've been retired now from running the organization for a number of years, but it's still very strongly in my heart. And I am deeply grateful to every single person who has felt the call to do this work. Um, it's not for everybody. It's absolutely not for everybody. Um, so it, th and those I of love, us who do. I just love how it was born out of your own grief, your grief for this deer, the, your grief for, was it your brother? And that the grief of those two things, you know, you had that little seed that I saw 
arise from your own ache and anguish and longing of that question of how, how can I hold my grief? How can I alchemize this? And you began yeah. and you went all around the Bay Area driving like a mad woman all over setting up different chapters. And now it's all over the world. And now you have albums and books of music that's been created. You had a whole conferences that you outgrew at Bishop's Ranch and you were doing them at Stanford University with thousands of people from all over the world coming to listen to you sing Vespers. And I love what you said, Kate. It was so wise. What is a tribe? Is a tribe is the people who know the same songs. And this time next week is Thanksgiving. And so many of us aren't going to be able to be with our families, but what would it be like if we all sang the same songs to each other on Zoom, that we took turns teaching each other just as Kate shared her, her song. What if we really could go into that and ask, instead of going around the table, go around the Zoom table and say, what is your favorite song? Teach it to me so I know your song. So if you would, we have time for one more, one more chant for you to teach us. Sure. And then what I'd love to do is go to Larry and Doug for their two poems, More of Grief. And then we can all, even though we can't all sing at the same time, we'll do We're Walking Each Other Home that you set okay. to music. Okay. Uh, the next song I want to teach you uh, has simple words again. You are not alone. I am here beside you. You are not alone. I am here now. And uh, I wrote this at year 11 of working with the Threshold Choir. And it's, <clears throat> to me, sometimes it's the, the only thing we can know when we come to a bedside. So it's important to sing about the only thing that we can know because we don't know about diagnosis or how long they'll live or anything, but we do know that we are there. <clears throat> and it goes, you are not alone. I am here beside you. You are not alone. I am here now. And in the recording, you're going to hear the three verses. I am not alone. You are here beside me. And we are not alone. We are here together. Thank you. Kate, my first memory of that song that I want to mention that you established as part of the Threshold Choir is that there's so often the burnout of people who are givers not receiving. And you so wisely acknowledge that. And Kate would set up a chair 
and people would take a turn. Whoever needed some nourishment would lay down in the chair and then have the community that was gathered for the practice session surrounded in a circle, sometimes laying their hands on that person as they closed their eyes and had everybody sing to them, sing into their heart. And I just remember that seeing those tear tracks go down the face of the person who had been pouring out their hearts, tending to others and then receiving and how deeply important, how wonderful it would be if we could take this song and send it to all of those workers in the hospitals who are doing COVID right now, all of those people who are just at their wits end. What if collectively everybody pledged on Thanksgiving day to sing this beautiful chant to the world? Kate, I, so I, I really think that the human voice has not, we haven't got the specified uh, equipment to figure out how profoundly the human voice affects the human body and soul. When we know that, we'll be so amazed. Absolutely. So I'm going to turn next again to Larry and Doug and just all too briefly, um, to say that these are two magnificent ritual masters themselves who have especially been working on the men's movement for decades. And one of the things that they created together was something called Rumi's Caravan. It's inspired by the work of that great mystic poet, they would gather a group of friends together and interweave it with music. And they would have a conversation through poetry. And they would begin by saying, Rumi says, and then one of the members would come up and then say, well, David White says, and there would be a theme that would evolve. And these were always done as benefits for the environment because Larry Robinson, one of the founders, was a Green Party mayor of Sebastopol and is deeply, passionately committed to issues of climate justice. My favorite moment of this was at a place called Osmosis Sanctuary. Picture as they recite these poems that you are in a Japanese garden surrounded by maples with a beautiful pond and images of the Buddha. And, and they take turns then with, there's a Persian uh, player of, of an instrument. I, I forget which instrument it was, but with the strings and fantastic. And then they would get up and they would recite these poems. And then interspersed would also be the music. So we'll have Doug and Larry do this. I, I'll just have you know that each of them knows over 200 poems by heart. And one more seed of inspiration that I would drop inside your mind is to say during this pandemic and during lockdown, neurologically, what can we do to wire in hope? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can wire in poetry. We can go to poetry and have words so that when we have no words for what we are faced with, we can turn to the others. So I'm going to invite you each to read a poem and we might want to adopt it as a spiritual psychological practice to take on memorizing a poem. Another thing to do during Thanksgiving, bring your favorite poems to the Zoom table and share what they mean to you. And then after this, we'll go back to Kate for our closing chant. So David White says, those who will not slip beneath the still surface on the well of grief, turning down through its black waters to the place we cannot breathe, will never know the source from which we drink the secret water cold and pure, nor find in the darkness glimmering the small gold coins thrown by those who wished for something else. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. I would put this poem on the altar of grief. It was the words of Halevi of Rome in the 13th century. The title is, For Those Who Have Died, These We Remember. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch, for your life has lived in me. Your words were a gift to me. Your laugh has lifted me. Tis a human thing, love, but a holy thing, 
to love what death can touch. Thank you. And Kate, will you lead us in? We are just walking each other home. I will. The words are from Ram Das with great, great thanks. And I think I'll just sing it in the interest of time rather than play the recording. We are all just walking each other home. 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 And as you're singing it all by yourself in your little box, please remember and enjoy the sound of OM that ends each line. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other home. We are all just walking each other We are all just walking each other home. Thank you so much, dear Kate. And now we pass this back to Jim Garrison. Thank you, Kayleen. Uh, thank you, Kate and Doug and Larry and Francis. Uh, this has been a profoundly moving session, everyone. It's taken us to a, a level that uh, we haven't traversed uh, so far in Humanity Rising. You know, we've talked about trauma, uh, transgenerational trauma with Thomas Hubel, um, but this was our first encounter with grief. And uh, so what we want to do is contemplate these matters uh, over the weekend. And then on uh, Monday, <clears throat> uh, Kayleen uh, and others will uh, lead us again into the well of grief. It's a, it's a deep well. It will come out on the other side because it will be the alchemical transformation of grief through the practices of creativity through art music and poetry people who've been through at least as terrible things as we're going through right now and in many ways worse and yet they transformed it into things of beauty yes uh that's very important everyone humanity is rising whatever depth we plumb it's always in the spirit of alchemy. So as Kayleen just said, we can come out the other side more empowered, more conscious, more intentional, and more compassionate. That's, that's why we're here. Day by day by day is just to provide an opportunity such as we've had today, uh, technical glitches and all, uh, that uh, uh, provide all of us an opportunity to feel our humanity more deeply so that we can rise together more powerfully. So thank you, everyone. We will uh, say goodbye now, and we'll meet again on Monday, same time, same station, 5 o'clock p.m. Central European time uh, for the alchemy of grief with Kayleen and friends. And I know that there's a chat link that's in the chat box for anyone who wants to gather together to share a little bit more. I know that I'll be going there and I hope that others can as well. Yes. 
Deep Thank blessing. you, everyone. See you on the chat session or see you on Monday. Bye-bye.